A lot has changed since the last time New York City Council Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito visited us on BK Live back in March of 2015. A year and some change later, New York City has made some history in steps of very important types of equality. Two first-of-their-kind efforts, for example, the Young Women's Initiative and the new legislation promoting menstrual equity. On the negative side, Puerto Rico, the speaker's birthplace, is going through one of the worst crises, and Donald Trump, about to be nominated at the GOP convention, has succeeded in part by opposing something she strongly supports, immigration reform. Well, in the next few minutes, we'll try to cover many of these issues and more. So let's welcome back the speaker of the New York City Council, Melissa Mark Viverito, who also happens to represent Council District 8 in Manhattan and the Bronx. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming back. We appreciate yes. it. So it's been a year and some changes. I just said a lot's happened. There's an election happening. The city is in a really great place, and we've got a lot of work to do. So let's start with getting things equal, this menstrual equity bill. Tell us why it's more than just the tampon bill. Well, I mean, look, when we talk about removing barriers mm -hmm. uh, to young women being able to succeed, and I know we'll talk about the Young Women's Initiative, that's yeah. what that was about. When you think about the context of a young woman being in a school setting, uh, right now, she has very dif difficulty to get access to menstrual products. Right. Uh, if something happens, right, it's that time of month, she has to figure out a way that she has to go to the nurse's office. It takes time away from her school, her yeah. schooling, her being in the classroom, obviously all of the type of stigma that that brings and shame. So the idea of just bringing this to the public, right, mm -hmm. maybe really reducing the barrier of that young woman having to face that. So now it's about making the products available in schools, right. um, also within uh, our correctional facilities and also uh, with regards to our homeless shelters. Right. So this is really something about equality and we really uh, excited that we've taken it to this level. Our council colleague, uh, Julissa Ferreras Copeland, has really taken on this leadership uh, and it's really t uh, been highlighted extensively right. um, across the nation. We are right now hoping that the state, the next step is that the state uh, remove the, the sales tax, tax yeah. right, on these products as, again, a way of demonstrating the inequality that exists, something that is natural, mm -hmm. right, uh, a part of our process as women, that we have to you know, pay for these products. So there's that issue. But right now, in terms of the message that we're sending right. uh, about embracing every young woman and removing any sort of barriers and the shame that comes with it. So this is an example. Right before we came on, you were speaking about the accessibility mm -hmm. of the council, and you guys are like the legislators next door. Yes. We see you in the community. You vote for you. You're our neighbors. You bring our concerns up. So I wonder just about this bill specifically and others like it, if that is an example of a very sort of ground-level point of entry for people to say, you know, I have a problem. Can the city council help me do this? I'm an educator. I see right. what young girls have to go through. I work with the homeless population, right. and this is sort of a basic thing that people can engage their communities with. Right. I mean, we're not removed from the communities we live in. We're yeah. on the front lines as, as legislators. Um, so a lot of times people have to understand, legislation usually comes, A, from our personal experiences mm -hmm. serving our districts, or two, from advocates right. or constituents themselves that come with us with a challenge. And we say, wait a minute, maybe there's a way of legislating this or creating some sort of uniformity mm -hmm. universally across the city to address this issue. So a lot of it is about engagement, uh, and that's why it's important for people to speak out, yeah. for people to share their experiences, people to access their representatives, because it is a lot of times that that is how legislation is made. So your voice is very valid in this process, and mm -hmm. we encourage that. So we've tried to, under my leadership, to really make the city council much more accessible to those that we represent, to explain what, in fact, is it that we do, what are the services that we provide to the yeah. average New York and the responsibilities we have. So we want to encourage people to weigh in. We are using social media. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're um, putting online all of our hearings, et cetera. This is a way of making ourselves much more accessible to our constituents. And there was a lot of talk a little while ago about the pay raises and how out of sync some of the salaries were with some of the districts where people were living, saying, now your council member is making three times the median, 30 times the amount of salary, but you still maintain that these people are doing an important job and they can still relate to their community members, even when it's an outmoded right. sort of 
income inequality, essentially. Right. I mean, our, our job is really 24-7. Mm -hmm. We have to be accessible and available uh, to deal with issues that happen. And, and obviously, the pay raise was a controversial issue. The reality is that that had not been addressed in over 10 years. The only way that you can address any sort of salary adjustment for the elected officials in the city is that we have to vote on that right. and we have to legislate that. Uh, so a commission was convened and they analyzed it and they, in fact, also indicated that uh, raise was overdue. So that was controversial, we understand, um, but we have a lot of work that we've been engaged in. We're a very active council. Yeah. Uh, we've done a lot of legislation. We do a lot of hearings. Uh, we're probably one of the most uh, productive councils that we've had in a while. And progressive, frankly. And progressive. And I'm very excited about the work that we've been engaged in. The menstrual equity issue is clearly one of them. The mm -hmm. Young Women's Initiative, uh, first of its kind initiative, yeah, is let's another. Get into that. It does yes. tell so well with that Young Women's Initiative. So explain to us what that is. So that's something that I had uh, called on last year about bringing together. And again, this is a lot of conversations that were emerging at a national level right. uh, around the initiative that uh, President Obama had done at the at the, f at the federal level. Right. The issue that it was focusing on young men of color, but we weren't really talking about young women right. and the barriers. So philanthropy, advocates, uh, constituents themselves, we convened this advisory group and this working group, and it convened extensively. A mm -hmm. lot of meetings, a lot of working groups, and at the end of the process, we came out with an extensive document with a lot of recommendations. We've partnered with philanthropy, where the city council uh, will be putting in $5 million for the next, each for the next two years. Mm -hmm. Philanthropy is matching that. Right. We're going to be implementing uh, a lot of the recommendations that came out uh, from those working groups about, again, breaking down barriers that prevent young women, and particularly young women of color, right. of achieving their full potential. So this is that theme mm -hmm. and that mantra of equality, um, of knowing that every child, every young woman has a potential, and that due to systemic issues, racism, et cetera, yeah. right, there's barriers that have been created, and how do we address that as a city? So it's really been an incredible conversation, right. and I'm really, really proud of this effort. And now we have $20 million behind awesome. it as well. So let's talk about that $20 million piece, because you mentioned uh, the president's My Brother's Keeper yes. was his initiative, and uh, Mayor Bloomberg in 2014 had his Young Men's Initiative, mm -hmm. and they focused on men of color and a lot of the barriers that were present in their communities. And it just reminds me of so often folks act like we're working from a scarcity model, particularly when it comes to communities of color and these initiatives where they feel like, oh, we're all fighting for the same piece of pie. But tell me how we can operate and sort of break that mindset to say we can have this young men's initiative and there are still problems facing young men of color and this women's initiative, young women's initiative as well. And they don't have to cannibalize each other. There's enough resources to go there to address these problems without neglecting one or the other. I agree. And I think that that's, um, it's, it's all, we can send that message in the way that we work, right? In the way that our, our agenda gets moved forward. But we have to understand and realize that there are certain sectors of our community, women, for instance, right, mm -hmm. that, and young women of color that face added barriers. And so the Young Men's Initiative has been working. It's been doing its thing. And the, the president obviously has put his effort behind right. My Brother's Keeper, and there's a lot of resources behind that. Um, but there was a call locally here where people really wanted to look at the issues yeah. of young women. And yeah. that, that doesn't take away from any other struggle. That doesn't take away from any other need that exists. Right. It's um, fi figuring out how do we come together and really support each other in the work that we're doing. So uh, we've been able to achieve a level of success on this, and we would join any other effort mm -hmm. that, again, seeks to remove systemic injustices that exist. Uh, these are generations in the yeah. making, and to chip away at it and tear it down and create that level of equality is not something that we will achieve overnight. But it's a real uh, priority for me, and it's mm -hmm. not only in the work of the Young Women's Initiative, in the criminal justice reform work that we've been doing and the immigration reform work we've been doing, that there are an LGBT yeah. a work that we've been doing. It's about equality and every single one of those uh, that I've mentioned, you know, sectors of our community really do face their own unique challenges. Yeah. Um, so the way we come together is recognizing that mm -hmm. and finding the unity and the commonality in our struggles and supporting each other so that we can achieve, um, a, you know, a more level playing field for we everybody. Win. Yes. So speaking of other wins, I know that a few years ago you sort of broke with the mayor and spent some of your political capital on getting a thousand new police recruits on the street. And I wondered if you, just looking back through the perspective from then till now, if you're happy with the way that that turned out. Look, we're, you know, going through an incredibly 
difficult moment, not only in this city, but in this country, what has transpired mm. um, the last couple of weeks. And, you know, none of us can be removed from that reality, particularly in this climate of, of the GOP convention yeah. and the DNC convention. But uh, to hear about Alton and Philando and, you know, Freddie Gray and everyone else uh, in the cases that are still outstanding, uh, there's a level of injustice that people feel. And then having, the, obviously, the assassinations and the murders of the police officers, there's a lot we are struggling with as a nation. We have to come together and yeah. figure out how we move ahead. So, you know, I believe in the conversation, and that was also very controversial. The issue of supporting police officers was to be able to say that we support this new vision that is being proposed of a community engagement right. and community policing model, which the prior administration was not in favor of. Oh, yeah, that's sort of the heart of the question, because I know with the Right to Know Act and it not uh, being put forward for a vote, we have a mayor who, by all accounts, is more open to this idea idea of police reform and right. accountability, where that wasn't the case with the previous administration, right. largely. So what happens when de Blasio is out of office and we're left with some promises from those in charge so instead of that the teeth of right. the law? Well, that's and that's an issue that we're dealing with. And I believe that um, the agreement that we've arrived at and the commitment that we've arrived at with the commissioner is one that is going to help us move ahead right away. Mm -hmm. I've never said that legislation is off the table. I've indicated that to advocates and others. But I want to be able to build a partnership mm -hmm. uh, with the commissioner who six months ago, eight months ago, was completely opposed to these pieces of legislation. We're now at a point where there is an embracing of aspects and a large number, you know, large aspects of the legislation. Let's work on that administratively. Let's push the goalpost forward. Let's figure out how we get there, and then we can revisit. Um, but there is a commitment to get this done now, to mm -hmm. have the training now, uh, to put these uh, measures in place now. Did you really and then see we can it as a that. stark choice between expediency and not even happening? Like in getting a commitment from the police commissioner to say, all right, we hear you and we see you have the will of the people, so we'll make these reforms versus waiting to have a law come into action? Well, I mean, I, there, part of it is yes. I mean, I want to, you know, really move this agenda forward. Yeah. I want to see reforms happen. And I'm really proud of the work we've done, not only on this matter now with this agreement, but on all the work that I've done prior to that, the Independent Commission on Rikers, mm -hmm. the Community Justice Reform Act to look at those low-level nonviolent offenses and trying to remove um, people getting permanent records for really dumb offenses, right? right? Uh, so there's a lot of work we've done, and I'm happy about that. I'm proud of that. Yeah. Uh, and we're moving continue to move forward. So I see this as a way of implementing change immediately, mm -hmm. some reforms, again, understanding that there are those that are not happy right. with this decision. Uh, but again, we will revisit this as we move along think, and, and have the conversation again. But it seems some people really get your view of this is like triage. If someone is bleeding, you have to sew it up and get things done as quickly as possible. And then you have others like Ramali Graham's mother saying, you have backdoor deals with the police. So how do you balance that and keep things moving forward for the city right. without letting it affect what really is best for New York? Right. I mean, look, it's that's part of leadership, right? Mm -hmm. I have there's a million different voices and points of view yeah. in this city. And as you make decisions, you know, all voices have to be part of the conversation. It doesn't mean I'm going to agree, right? right? And I have to formulate something that I believe is in the best interest of the city in consultation with my colleagues. Uh, and and, and at, at, at least acknowledging, I've been very clear, mm -hmm. and this is the national discourse, there mm -hmm. is racism within our institutions, right? There is racism within our system right. um, that over generations has just continued to perpetuate itself. So to uproot that, right, to really figure out a path of greater equality that respects people's constitutional rights is work that will, that is, you know, not going to end anytime soon, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, so we, I'm committed to that. And through the work that I've done as a legislator, as a leader, has been, my whole commitment has been about uh, equality, has been about justice yeah. and humanity, right? And really, this is, this is a moment where we have to come together. There is so much tension, and um, the Republican candidate at yeah. the national level um, is a disgrace. Uh, I think it will take us backwards considerably. Uh, this is an individual who feeds on division, on anger, mm -hmm. on hatred. Uh, that is what his whole platform is based on. Do we just get a preview of what you're going to say at the uh, Democratic <laughs> National Convention? 
Well, I mean, I'm, we have not a, had any acknowledgement or uh, conversations on that front. I mean, so uh, obviously I'm interested in seeing a Democrat in the White House, yeah. and I'm interested in making sure that we have a platform that embraces everyone and that it really is inspiring mm -hmm. and an uplifting message. What we hear from the GOP is not an uplifting message, and particularly in this time, in this country, that is what we need. Yeah. Um, so I'm really concerned, and nothing should be taken for granted. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really important moment in, in our our history and our mo and moment in time in my lifetime, yeah. uh, and so I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that those issues I consider a priority are, are addressed and that we have legislators that are responsive to that and are committed um, to that. And so there's a lot of work we have yet to do. So we're totally out of time, but I'm going to sneak in one more and ask you, with the Democratic National Convention and Hillary's up there, she's yes. been gotten the endorsement from Bernie now. How do you engage people, especially in New York, that was so fervent for him to not go home with their ball and participate and see the process through? Well, I have been a strong supporter of Hillary, with very her clear. Yeah. Um, I think she is the best candidate, but understanding that there were sectors of, of the party that um, feel very strongly about other candidates. You know, mes Bernie's message was very clear about unifying us and, and coming together as a nation and as a party. Uh, so he has thrown his support behind her. I'm glad that we're united now and that we can really make sure that we work on the ground uh, to implement policies that are going to help all of us. And Hillary, I believe, is that right candidate. And I'm excited about being at the convention uh, to support her. Awesome. Moving to D.C.? Huh? Are you moving to D.C.? <laughs> You're trying to bait me here. Oh, huh? No, no, I was just asking. There's there are someone new is going to be. I'm in that very happy here now. in New York. <laughs> All right. Well, we're happy Thank to you. have you on BK Live. Thank you. Please come by anytime. We'll talk about Puerto Rico. Yes. There was so much stuff today, yes. but we appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you so much.